This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Good afternoon, uh, and for all those in Europe, um, good evening. It's um, so it's for me a pleasure to to introduce Ali Reza, since um, I had the honor of sitting on his dissertation uh, committee at ISO, the Institute uh, for the Study of the Ancient World, uh, where he recently obtained his PhD on the topic of the currency reforms of the of the Alsacid Empire, 247 BC, 224 CE. And I, I want to commend Ali Reza for having picked up on that topic because there, there is a lack of recent scholarship on uh, Parthia and uh, Sasanians as well, or even Achaemenid. Um, the Persian world has often been understudied compared to the, to the Greek world, which is, uh, I think, a shame uh, since uh, Persia uh, traces back its um, uh, currency tradition all the way to Mesopotamia. And as many of us know, that's where um, Axilber started. So the very concept of currency um, has got a Mesopotamian origin and there is no discontinuity between um, you know, Assyria, Babylon, uh, the Achaemenids, uh, Parthians, uh, and so forth. So it's an extremely fascinating um, monetary uh, tradition that predates the Greeks and I everyone else around the Mediterranean Sea. So a few words about Ali Reza. So um, Ali Reza comes from, from Iran, has been in the US for quite a few years, but he, he spends as well some time in Europe and speaks multiple languages from his CV, including uh, my mother tongue, uh, French. So thank you for, <laughs> for being francophone as well. So Ali Reza had his BA from Ba'ali Sina University in Iran, in archaeology, then pursued in the archaeological field with a Master of Arts at Vrije Universiteit uh, Amsterdam. Uh, excuse my Dutch, I don't speak Dutch then um, came to the US and uh, got his PhD, as I just said, at ISO, uh, working on uh, Parthian, uh, the Parthian currency system. I'd like to say as well that Ali Reza got several uh, awards and distinction uh, during his early career, uh, since he's still very early in his career, including a prestigious fellowship uh, at the Smithsonian uh, Institute in Washington. So without further ado, Ali Reza, you've got the floor. Thank you very much, Jill, for this generous introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be presenting at the ANS Long Table Talk. Um, as you just heard, I just finished, defended my dissertation at NYU's Institute for the Study of the Ancient World. But the ANS has been as crucial for furthering my research into the study of the Arsacid Parthian Empire and broadly uh, the Iranian world. So today's talk is in a way promotion of my research, but is more so a reminder of the importance of the ANS collection in the, in the study of Iranian numismatics, including that of the Arsacids. In a more specific sense, my research shows the development of a cohesive monetary organization in the Arsacid Empire. It emphasizes the role of both silver and bronze coins in accelerating productive activities within the empire itself. I also, in my research, tend to demonstrate that currency systems not just reflect economic, but also cultural and political interactions in Mesopotamia and Iranian plateau during this period. I've noticed that the scholarly interpretation of political structures often influences how uh, one interpret economic and uh, monetary systems. So I will begin by reviewing how the scholarly discourse views the Arsacids as a polity, but also uh, understanding how the RSS is established uh, by metallic currency system based on a standardized weight 
requires tracing earlier economic developments in the Achaemenid and Seleucid periods, as uh, Gilles also pointed out. So I will explain how the circulation of silver in the Achaemenid period created a need for bronze coinage in the aftermath of Alexander's conquest in the Seleucid period. And since weight measures were fundamental to exchange practices involving coins, I will ask why a multitude of weight measures was necessary in the Achaemenid and Seleucid periods, and how the Arsacids centralized coin production and integrated the dram unit of weight or weight measure with the dram unit of currency or coin denominator. So my talk today is not only about coinage, but also broader economic and political structure of the Arsacid period. I think this is this approach is necessary for especially for such a misunderstood dynasty originated in Iran, a place that, again, as you pointed out, uh, still is more or less an enigma to many ancient historians. The fundamental basis of my approach is that these coins were used in the context of exchange and were not primarily issued with the intention to be hoarded as reserves, fresh coins as reserves. So this is somewhat a pushback against many numismatic publications on the coinage of the broader Iranian world. And I look forward to your questions and discussion at the end of the presentation. So my decision to investigate the Arsacid monetary history, in fact, originates from attending the American Numismatic Society summer seminar in 2017. And as you see from this photo, when I was a young man, I had the pleasure of attending the seminar with ANS's own Dr. Jesse Kraft. And in fact, interacting with Jesse and learning about the currency and weight disparities in the colonial Americas inspired some aspects of my research in formulating my thesis on weight and currency integration in the Arsacid. Of course, there are several comparisons that I make with the Greek world, but also uh, aspects of, especially the, uh, also the theoretical approaches of the 1920s and 1930s. The ANS holds a comprehensive collection of Arsacid silver and bronze coins, totaling over more than uh, 2,000 coins. And most of these were amongst the largest single donation ever made to the ANS, 87,000 coins of the Greek world by Edward Newell, who you all know. He was uh, the president of the ANS from 1916 to 1941. And while the number of Arsacid coins in Newell's collection excuse me, was a smaller than his collection of Alexander or Seleucid coins, his scholarly interest in the Arsacids was by no means any less. His contributions to Arsacid monetary history are still among some of the most influential works, in particular on the relationship between the imperial Arsacid coins and those by the local subordinate kingdoms. Newell traveled to Iran on several occasions and was in touch with some of the major scholars on Iran, including Ernst Herzfeld, the archaeologist of the Achaemenid Persopolis. Herzfeld also had an interest in collecting coins, and according to his diaries, he met Newell in Iran in the 1930s, and he sold Newell a number of Arsacid coins including those by the local kingdom of Elamites. And some of these uh, ended up in the ANS collection through Newell's posthumous bequest.
I should point out that besides the ANS, there were also other institutions in the US that proved crucial for my numismatic research on the Arsacids. My interest in particular in bronze coinage was sparked after visiting the University of Michigan's Kelsey Museum of Archaeology in 2019. This museum holds over 30,000 Arsacid bronze coins excavated at Seleucia and the Tigris. That's the site near modern Baghdad. The excavation was done by the University of Michigan and Toledo Museum in the 1920s and 1930s. And finally, I should point out, point out a wonderful opportunity awarded to me in 2020 to analyze more than 500 Arsacid silver and bronze coins at the Smithsonian National Numismatic Collection through the doctoral fellowship. I'd like to extend a warm gratitude to the ANS chief curator, Dr. Ellen Feingold, and the collection's specialist, Jennifer Glow, for the opportunity uh, that I was there for six months and pulling trays after trays and also supply equipment for photography, as well as uh, XRF analysis. I will discuss the preliminary results of my XRF analysis with you as well at the end of the presentation. Much of my research focuses on the relationship between silver and bronze coins in the Arsacid Empire. It has often been argued that the value of bronze coinage in economic transactions was negligible, which might lead one to doubt they could offer meaningful insights into the economic and cultural history of this misunderstood period. But thanks to Robert McDowell's 1935 publication on bronze coins of Arsacid Seleucia, the 30,000 bronze coins, I learned that studying base metal coins is essential for understanding broader currency relationships in the Arsacid Empire. McDowell clearly demonstrated the symbiotic relationship between silver and bronze coins, which helps revealing insights into the legal capacity of the Arsacid administration. This monetary system established by the Arsacids consisted of one main commodity currency of intrinsic value, the silver draft, which also acted as the unit of account. This monetary system also included fiduciary and fiat bronze coins of nominal value in both high and low denominations. This monetary system established by the Arsacids survived persisted for more than a millennia, extending through the Sasanian and early into the early Islamic periods. In his publication, MacDowell was able to identify two currency regions in the Arsacid Empire, which he applied to both silver and bronze. He found that from the point of view of currency relationships, we have two belts. The user one is the users of tetradrams, silver tetra and bronze tetradrams, extending from Syria down the Euphrates into southern Mesopotamia and then into southern Iran. And another belt, the users of drams from central and northern Iran into northern Mesopotamia as far as the Euphrates. MacDowell suggested that understanding how these two currency regions were established would not only explain the structure of exchange, but also wider political and cultural interactions within the Arsacid Empire. But he concluded that such an important study must wait on the discovery of more adequate evidence. Although the study of Arsacid coins began in the early 18th century, and it is now about 90 years since MacDowell's publication, 
The evidence of economic life in our Sassid Iran is still meager and sporadic and difficult to interpret. Since jean fois Vallon's time, references to Parthians in classical sources have helped construct a chronology of our Sassid kings and the sequence of their coins. But relying solely on these sources may distort the political history of the period and lead to misidentification of coinage and misinterpretation of the general monetary system. Some classical sources portray the Arsacid dynasty as chaotic and fragmented due to a lack of international diplomacy, cohesive policies, and worst of all, self-destructive dynastic competition. These sources have led some modern scholars to identify Arsacid Iran as a rogue state, which means it's warmongering, lawless, and unwilling to engage in diplomacy with its neighbors. It was allegedly a regime so predatory that it even held its own people in contempt. If this description holds true for the Arsacid political structure, then it influenced how we view bronze coins. They should be viewed in this context as signs of economic decline and isolation and sociopolitical instability. And the presumed weakness of the legal institutions of this dynasty is demonstrated by the phenomenon of caste wars. If we consider all these as counterfeits, then this supposedly weaker state was unable to prevent their production. The reason I discuss the views on the Arsacid political structure is because the interpretation of political instability has directly influenced numismatic analysis. In his important quantitative analysis, the author of this publication detected regular silver drum production at media in Western Iran over two centuries with phases of immense spikes in the volume of coinage. Yet he concluded that monetary practice was lost. His underlining reason for this economic phenomenon is what he called a chronic political instability in the Arsacid Empire. Many publications have adopted this model of instability to refer to this period as an era of 400 year civil war, repeatedly calling it the Parthian Dark Age. Interpreting the Arsacid dynasty as an unstable rogue state has some roots in the application of the scholarly concept of long durée. This approach, which is quite useful, has been excessively applied to ancient West Asia and North Africa. It suggests that these societies were inherently drawn to preserve their economic practices as if they are cultural traditions. So even over time, when some of these practices became less logical or less efficient, that they still maintain those. So long durée implies continuity without change. Putting this theoretical or ideological approach into practice in describing a 700 year period of Iranian history, David Engels argued that only during the Seleucid period did the central authority possess a strong control over local administrators while allowing at the same time for private economic actors. He suggested that even the dissolution of the Seleucid Empire was less a result of actions by the Seleucids themselves than a symptom of a feudalization process that began under the Achaemenids and continued under the Arsacids. This 
cultural symptom seemingly persisted despite the fortunes of many Achaemenid and Arsacid rulers with long uncontested ranks. Engels characterized this Middle Eastern feudalism as a central power having limited control over local authorities and most of the population becoming the manorial serfs. So in such a state, it seems uh, that it would be unable to create a centralized monetary system. The main challenge to the idea of a 400 year decline in the Arsacid period is found in the archeological evidence. Decades of excavations across Iraq, Iran, and Turkmenistan reveal a noticeable increase in the number of settlements and irrigation activity from the first century BCE onwards that fits within the firm uh, establishment of the Arsacid Empire. So the archaeological evidence alone necessitates a different political model, not based on centuries of civil wars. It seems more likely that the level of productive activity was so high and the market monetized that even the smallest payments required bronze coins to accommodate them. And such rapid and extensive growth surpassed the royal mint's ability to supply coins everywhere. And some local authorities uh, produced cast coins, which may have retained the status of official currencies. To reconcile the archaeological evidence of increased production with the evidence of coin production, I think it's more fitting to describe the context of our Sassid bronze coins similar to the situation in the city of Rhodes in the aftermath of the earthquake. The context where bronze coins used in building constructions, for instance, as reported by Polybius. To further disqualify the so-called Middle Eastern feudalism, it's necessary to demonstrate that the transformations under the, the Seleucids and the Arsacids had roots in the silverization of the Persian Achaemenid Empire. Often economic data alone, divorced from an archeological and historical context, are susceptible to divergent interpretations. This chart shows the massive rise in the price of barley in early Achaemenid Babylonia. Such a rise might be indicative of economic upheaval or famine, but the overwhelming number of publications interpret this period as one of so-called economic growth. Such interpretation is rooted in other evidence including archaeological evidence of a stability in Achaemenid Babylonia. A similar phenomenon can be observed in Iran during the Arsacid period. But before delving further into the Arsacid, I must explain my approach to defining money and the significance of units of weight in this definition, but also for uh, circulation of coinage. I can tell you blatantly that I disagree with the coin-centric definition of money, as well as with the barter, or barter theory of money's origin. I stress that there is no single explanation for the many origins of money, but one of its fundamental functions is its role as a standard of value, as money of account, derived from weight measures. Political rulers, uh, political leaders had a role in establishing and enforcing the laws governing these weight measures. This is where money becomes intertwined with the process of lawmaking. We find that without the use of coinage in, the, in this Achaemenid treasury tablet from Persopolis, 
A monetary system does not need coinage when it can enumerate even the minutest payments in weights of silver. And looking at coin hoard evidence disco discovered in Achaemenid Babylonia, when coinage entered this system, it was subjected to being cut and weighed in accordance with existing weight standards. In this, his famous statement, Aristotle maybe was hinting at the laws of weight measures, which consistently influenced the value of coins over time and in different places. But unlike his comment, the coins in the context of this hoard were not demonetized, but rather revalued. Even as coinage became prevalent in Babylon during the reigns of Alexander and the Seleucids, it adhered to existing exchange practices and weight measures. In the cell contract, the quantity of starters of Alex or tetradram coins of Alexander held no significance in the payment process. These coins, even though they were based on the Attic weight standard, they were enumerated, they were valued based on a Babylonian unit of weight, uh, in this case, shekel. Even in areas that were exposed to coinage longer, we find a similar phenomenon, for instance, at, Ar at Seleucid and Arsacid Dora Europus. While the tetradrams of Tyre were highly sought after at Dora, they were enumerated in this long contract based on the dram unit of weight of the city itself. There is an established ratio between dram and starter. It was not universal, but even with that ratio, it's only possible to estimate the number of tetradram coins implied in this contract. Not all monetized societies needed to integrate weight measure with coin denomination. Um, for instance, the case of colonial Amer North America's English pence was the weight and prices were uh, reckoned in English pence, but the Spanish dollar was most common. Still, there were cases, I like to argue in the case of our Sassid Iran, that coinage was integrated into exchanging practices when the weight measure and the common coin denomination were the same. This condition was established by the Arsacids at Ekpatana in Western Iran, which was their economic center. I will delve into the Arsacid period uh, in better details, but I must dis discuss the importance of the introduction of bronze coinage uh, under Alexander and the Seleucids after the conquest of the Achaemenid Empire. Again, even with literary accounts available, contradicting conclusions can be drawn about the effects of monetary policies. According to this entry from one of the Babylonian astronomical diaries dating to the reign of Antiochus I, Silver was collected from temples and households to fund the king's campaigns in Syria against the Ptolemies. As a result, purchases were made with bronze coins, not with silver. The final line in this text uh, is mentioning a total upheaval. And up to recent years, I had assumed that bronze coins was the cause of this crisis. But now I'd like to suggest a different interpretation of this event, where famine already existed and the king's policy of distributing bronze coins intended as fiduciary or nominal replacements of silver coins was a solution to a recurring situation we find in ancient and modern history. A silver shortage brought about by the urgent requisition of silver to fund military campaigns. So bronze coins were a solution in this context, not part of the problem. To better explain this, um, I should point out that 
Over the past decade, I visited several coin collections in the U.S., including the ANS, as well as Yale Art Gallery, National Numismatic Collection. So I was exposed to American currencies. And there are a few details about the 19th and early 20th century. Even the conjectural, uh, they taught me some important aspects of the effects of monetary production. So they showed the importance of and the rationale behind bronze coin distribution in Seleucid Babylon. It's helpful to draw parallels with a much more recent economic crisis, the Great Depression of the 1930s. 1930s was an important era that transformed our social understanding of money and resulted in a surge of scholarly publications amongst anthropologists and historians on the history and theoretical understanding of money. Granted, Great Depression was a far larger and more complex global phenomenon and exacerbated in the US by environmental disasters. But in his publication, John Maynard Keynes argued that the root of the problem were in age old monetary policies that were being practiced since ancient times. Until 1933, circulating banknotes were backed by precious metals. It was the age of convertibility, which limited the federal government's ability to print money for loan and loans and public projects. Keynes suggested that the population and the society's productive capacity had outpaced available precious metals. So the solution to this money shortage was the termination of the gold standard to print more money. Let us recall that the confiscation of precious metals was not just an ancient phenomenon in the Seleucid period. Our currency system today is built upon such coercive but maybe necessary measures. One can confidently say that money shortage was a problem in the Seleucid period, especially for internal exchange when silver was funding foreign campaigns. One solution to this was bronze coinage in large and small denominations. Examining Seleucid monetary policies reveals a less coercive but more pragmatic approach. To promote the use of bronze coins of large and small denominations by counting as opposed to weighing them, the Seleucids adjusted the weight of their coins to align with existing weight measures in each region that you see here with their mint signature. Such a multi-currency system likely facilitated the circulation of this new fiduciary coinage which was occasionally convertible into silver of heavier denominations, but also in cases it was fiat with no silver backing, particularly during periods of silver scarcity. A multi-currency system like that of the Seleucids is not only an economic phenomenon, but also a political and cultural one. The existence of numerous valuation systems within one polity leads to competition between local communities. Such systems created the need for conversion, which is time consuming and susceptible to fraud and speculation. The 19th century United States was an eye-opening case to me where each state issued its own currencies, causing early Americans considerable difficulty and insecurity in making payments, especially while traveling. This testimony from a traveler going from Kentucky to Virginia shows that in most cases, the money he carried was not accepted outside of Kentucky. And if he converted it, 
money char changers charged extra fees. Contrary to the early United States, the ancient Greeks recognized that sharing the same weight measures and coinage signified not only economic cooperation, but political alliance. Therefore, commercial leagues comprising several city estates were common. One of the most influential history, uh, leagues in history was the Delian League which led to the creation of the Athenian Empire. For Iran and Mesopotamia, the adoption of the Attic weight standard was revolutionary because of how it was extended by Alexander's conquest to these regions. And it formed the basis of Seleucid and Arsacid currency system. In fact, it seems that a model of unity or cooperation seems more fitting than the model of instability or competition to the Arsacid case. It has been suggested that the local nature of minting practices in the Arsacid empire reflects the decentralized and heterogeneous nature of imperial power. But a close examination of changes in the style and denomination of these coins reveals that the Arsacid monetary system grew far more centralized than those of the Achaemenid and Seleucid periods. When the Arsacid Mithridates first conquered Ecbatana and Babylonia and was declared king of kings in 140 BCE, there were several former client kingdoms of relevance here two of which were Kingdom of Par Persis or Pars in southern Iran and the Kingdom of Elamites in southwest Iran around Susa. Strabo describes conditions in these kingdoms under the Arsacids. He considered the early Arsacids as, quote, weak, but he did not hold the same views about the later kings. He noted that uh, the Arsacids pacified local unrest and resolved conflicts. Such era of stability was attributed to the might of the Parthians, to whom all the peoples in that part of the world are subject. By the first century BCE, during the so-called Parthian Dark Age, numismatic evidence suggests the subjugation of this king leading to greater similarity in the regalia with the Arsacid king of kings. More importantly than the designs even, is that these kingdoms shortly after the Arsacid took over abandoned the Seleucid tradition of uh, silver tetradrams and issued drams uh, as was the Arsacid uh, monetary system when they were just a kingdom. And these remained to be silver drams in Persis, but later transformed into bronze drams in the case of Elamites. In terms of the political structure, it has been suggested that the Arsacids co-opted the local dynasties or assimilated them into their house through political marriages. Even though silver coin production was centralized and local kingdoms assimilated with the Arsacid house, these kingdoms survived to the dynasty's end, with Persis continuing to issue silver coins. Joseph Wolski, a prominent scholar of Arsacid history, suggested that this policy wasn't a sign of Arsacid weakness, but of the strength of a pacifist Parthian imperialism, which has spurred local dynasties, encouraging their alignments with the Arsacids, at times at the expense of the Romans. Despite Arsacid pacifist policies allowing local kings to exist and some to strike coinage, 
The monetary organization of Mesopotamia and the Iranian plateau underwent complete reorganization under the rule. The Royal Mint of Ekbatana produced the largest quantity of silver coinage of a stable purity and weight only in drafts. And these were found in cor different corners of the Arsasi territory, including Dora Europus. On the other hand, the Imperial Mint of Seleucia issued a small number of silver tetradraps. And over time, except for Persis issuing silver drams, the imperial mint, as well as the uh, kingdoms on the fringes of the Iranian plateau, issued heavy bronze coins with the same design and weight as the earlier silver coins that were circulating in those regions. It appears that the production and circulation of quality silver became concentrated on the Iranian plateau. And this was a departure from the Seleucid period when silver was concentrated in Babylonia and the Levant. This shift is a revival of the silverization of Iran that had begun under the Achaemenids. To understand how the bronze coins of local rulers uh, interacted with the Arsacid imperial silver coins, some of the Greek sources could be useful uh, for my interpretation. Bronze coins often stood in for or replaced silver coinage in the Greek world, particularly for low denominations. But there were also other cases in which bronze was intended to replace silver of all denominations, including the heavy ones. The Greek cities of Italy have some useful examples, not just supported by this anecdote in the Sodar Sotelian Economica, but also by coins. There are some bronze coins the Greek cities of Italy issued that bear the inscriptions dram and tetradram. Also, there were coins with dots as numeral markers, which became lighter, but kept the same number of dots. Um, they became fiduciary coinage. Looking at the Elimian bronze drams, we can suggest that they likely served as representatives or replacements for the silver drams previously in circulation in this kingdom. Another evidence from the Greek wall, if we invoke it from Thrace, we could expect that the established ratio between Arsacid silver drams of high quality and Elimian bronze drams was certainly not one to one. So they were exchanged at a discount. It still is significant that my meteorological analysis of 72 Elimian bronze coins and 114 Arsacid silver drams at the National Numismatic Collection shows that the weight of these coins were adjusted to the weight of silver drams, including the time before and after the weight reduction of or the second in the first century BCE. Still, the silver content of Arsacid silver drams remains stable, rarely decreasing below 80%, according to several metallurgical analyses, including my own at the National Numismatic Collection, which are on the reign of 14 Arsacid kings spanning three centuries. One thing that I've noticed in a, a few recent uh, a sort of analysis done on our Sassid coins is that they analyzed silver tetradrams, which and they noticed that there was uh, there were progressive debasement, and they interpret that for the whole period, whereas they should have focused on the silver drams, which were the main commodity currency. 
silver drums of the Arsacid and local kings of Pars both served as commodity currencies based on the dram unit of weight. Integrating the weight measure with coinage to facilitate counting points. In economic documents like the sales contracts in Greek and Parthian, we don't find them explicitly mentioning points. And the way that silver vessels are weighed are this exactly the same. But this period, in this period, uh, the evidence shows that one dram denomination equaled one dram as the unit of weight, which would make counting or tallying points more possible, more efficient. And the reason for that I know one dram denomination equal one dram unit of weight is that the weight of coins and the weight of silver vessels, as mentioned in the inscription, remained the same over centuries. So the coins were based on the unit of weight and were not divorced from it. It's for the Sasanians, it, the most significant or sassy legacy is this stable silver currency system centered around the trap. The Arsacids made the conscious effort to centralize silver among the Parthians of Northern Iran and their closest allies, the Persians of Southern Iran. But granting the frontier regions the privilege to mint bronze coins was not a trivial gift from the King of Kings. These bronze coins likely offer significant profit to these kingdoms, especially considering their strategic commercial positions on the Persian Gulf. A decree from Cestus in Asia Minor shows the pride associated with the city's right to mint its own bronze coins and the profit it would bring because presumably those who would enter these kingdoms with their silver coins had to convert it into local bronze, which means that their silver would remain in the city. This decree also underscores the importance of trust in this fiduciary and sometimes fiat currency with no silver backing. In this final slide, I would like to remind that the monetary changes and currency centralization that occurred under the Arsacids might not have achieved such success without its pacifist imperialism. Until the final decades of the dynasty, this administration accommodated local desires for cultural self-determination for the sake of political cohesion something that was also done in the Ptolemaic Kingdom. The blending of Zoroastrian concepts with other religions has rarely been explored, but the bilingual inscription on a bronze statue at Seleucia on the Tigris illustrates that an interpretatio greco was applied to Zoroastrian deities. This evidence is important because it counters the notion of Greco-Iranian antagonism and more refers to shared practices. It was in this syncretic environment of the Hellenistic period that the Arsacids embraced and transformed Greek economic practices while laying the groundwork for the formation of the Sasanian Empire. Thank you everyone for your attention. Um, I'm not sure if I should uh, stop sharing the screen. Maybe there are comments. I'm going to stop it. Just, I mean, you might have oh. to put it back up for a question, but we'll see. I see comments here. I see one question actually in the, uh, I thank Mark. Thank you for the Wikipedia page about Ernst Herzfeld. That's the uh, Iran archaeologist on Iran. Uh, and from Daniel, uh, they say that are the mean weights of the bronze coins proportional to their values. So that's the big issue. Value is usually seen through prices. Denomination, we can say, is draft. But the price 
or the value is based on existing text. Specifically for the Arsacid period, we don't have text mentioning the price of bronze coins, what it exchanged. Uh, but that's where I brought the uh, Pompidas text from Thrace that I think it was based on individual contracts made where they would decide how many silver, what kind of silver would buy how many of those bronze coins. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Um, if I go to the next one, can anything be said about the sources of silver in our Sassid coins? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, about the sources of silver, it's always uh, the tests could be dubious in many cases, especially in Iran, where there is no uh, comprehensive study of the signature of the ores from particular mines. But one thing that we notice in terms of mining activity, the Arsacid and Sasanian periods were important periods. That's what geoarchaeologists have noticed. And in the surrounding areas of Ekbatana in northern Iran, it's actually one of the epicenters of Galena lead mines. As we know that silver is extracted usually through uh, lead mines that are uh, rich in Argentiferous Galena. So um, I like to rely on the fact that they didn't rely on outside the imperial boundaries for their silver as it was the case of 17th century Iran. Possibly there were internal sources on the plateau, not in Mesopotamia. Thank you. I'm sure. Um, the next question is, are the coins pure silver and or bronze or alloys? So this is where, um, I mean, I can screen share again to just quickly show you the um, XRF analysis. Uh, sorry, let me go back here. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my I need to adjust my screen. Is it being shared now or? It was, but then it went away. So you just bring. It oh, back. oh shoot. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know what happened there. Okay, I can just show you like this. Um, this is the, I just enlarged this. This is the XRF analysis I've done on the silver drams. Um, and there is this stability. I mean, there is no 100% silver coin. I don't think even the early uh, Lydian coins were 100% pure. So there is a percentage of copper, but this is consistent, usually it's 80% silver. But uh, other denominations uh, like tetradrams, it over a century, it turns into billion and then turns into total bronze, but with the same design as if it's a continuation of the earlier silver series. Thank you. Sure. Um, the next question, are the mean weights of the bronze coins proportional to their denominations? Yes, yeah, so um, we have two groups of bronze coins in the Arsacid period. We have heavy bronze coins that are dram and tetradram and their weight are following. Uh, but they turn into bronze and are still with the same weight. And then we have a small change too, in particular calculus. Actually under Mithridates first, we had multi-denomination multi of uh, calculus, so a small change up to tetra calculus, because they actually had the sign of the calculus with X on it, similar to the Seleucid ones. Um, but then later it becomes single small change, only calculus. Um, I see, uh, yes, octocalculus weighing 30 gram or so were issued onto Osiris, but no silver tetradrams. 
so um i can ref uh, i i just read the whole thing do you think this is an example of emergency switch to bronze from silver tetradrams following trajan's attack on seleucia so during the second century ce there were roman uh, invasion of the parthian empire but only mesopotamia so they didn't get to the iranian plateau and uh, during that time, there is an article I could share with you by uh, Fabrizio Senisi that shows that actually silver tetradram production uh, was being done on the regular annual basis. It kept going for the regular annual basis, and it didn't seem to have any interaction with the Trajan's invasion. So in some, in the years that Trajan was invading the production of silver tetradrams remained the same as the other years. So it seems that uh, tetra silver tetradram, whatever it was, was not necessarily con connected to uh, military expenditure. And also, as I pointed out, um, it wasn't an emergency immediate switch to bronze tetradrams. Silver tetradram was being gradually over a century from all this second that's first century BC was being progressively debased. There's also a new question in the chat. Yes, I'm reading it. Uh, Rob, uh, uh, Bob asked that, what was the span of the high quality drum minting in Equatana? Are the Vologiza six of the same purity as the earlier material? Yes. Actually, Michael Alrom has years ago say that uh, the purity of early Sasanian silver drams is the same as the late Arsacid silver drams. So in terms of purity, there is a continuation of the silver dram on the plateau, which also makes sense because Iran itself was quite stable during the Arsacid period. If there was a Roman invasion also, it was concentrated on Mesopotamia. <laughs> well, you know, Alireza, I've never seen so many questions on the chat. <laughs> really? Oh my God, that's wonderful. Uh, that's a, a big success. Um, that's wonderful. I'm very really happy to hear. Yeah. If I may ask one question, uh, it's 1.55, so we may have a few more minutes. I remember from your dissertation, but I forgot the details. I think you you're talking about an inscription where a higher purity Seleucid drag or tetra drag was, was not exchanged at one to one against a, a Parthian a silver coin because it had a lower fineness. So there was like a discount or something on an exchange that do you, I, do you see what I'm talking? I'm referring to. I don't recall an inscription. Oh, oh, well, we, we, we can check this uh, after, but I, I remember sure. something like sure. uh, coins of different um, really would not be exchanged one to one in uh, in one in one case. Right. So I think I just in my dissertation I made this broad uh, assumption that these coins, even though they are drams bronze drams in terms of weight, they are not exchanged one to one. But actually, Gilles, I relied on Greek evidence to talk about that, like Pompidas account, which I showed here in the talk. Um, unfortunately, in terms of references for the Arsacids, we don't have text. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Ah, so thank you so much. It looks like uh, we've exhausted the questions. Um, thank you again for delivering this um, this talk at the at VNS. And as you said, it's like your second home after ISO. So we're, we're very glad you could deliver it. Um, My pleasure. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for inviting me.